Um, but anyway, um, welcome. Um, I think I know most of you in the room. My name is MJ Mulcahy, and I'm the chair of the AOTF Board of Trustees, um, and we welcome you here. Um, we are so pleased you could join us. AOTF promotes and celebrates research excellence at uh, various career stages with the vision of having a vibrant science that builds knowledge to support effective evidence-based occupational therapy. This year, we will hear from our early and mid-career research excellence awardees and our uh, newly inducted Academy of Research members who will share their career journey and their latest research. Um, I would like to thank the AOTF Academy of Research and AOTF Awards and Recognition Committee for their time and dedication to reviewing the extraordinary candidates that came to us this year. At the end of the talks, we'll have opportunity uh, to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, so with that, the AOTF Early and Mid-Career Research Excellence Award recognizes and supports investigators who are contributing and have problems to advance knowledge in the field of occupational therapy through their uh, research. Our 2023 Early Career Research Excellence Awardee, Lisa Duckett, is an assistant professor in the Division of Occupational Therapy at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Unfortunately, Dr. Juckett is unable to join us um, live today, but she recorded her presentation for us to, um, to see. So let's hear from Dr. Juckett. Uh, I am very sorry that I cannot be there with you this week in Kansas City. Um, I had a last minute and unexpected change in plans, um, but uh, so my sincere apologies. This recognition from AOTF really does mean the world to me, and so I'm very honored to be selected as an awardee this year and honored to, of course, share the stage with my fellow awardees whose work has laid the foundation for early career folks like myself to be able uh, to do the work that we do. In OT, so uh, sincere thank yous to them. Uh, I should probably mention before I get into this talk about impactful partnerships and expanding the reach of OT in social service agencies, I should mention that uh, I'm Lisa Juckett and I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University in the division of OT. Um, but I haven't always been an assistant professor, so just a, a little bit of background as to who I am and, and how um, uh, my career has, has come to be so far. Uh, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, um, but uh, I did venture out of the Midwest to complete my undergraduate degree as well as my master's of occupational therapy at uh, Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut. So uh, go Bobcats. Uh, after graduating with my MOT, I landed my first uh, full-time occupational therapy job back in Columbus at Ohio State University's Wexner Medical Center in their inpatient rehab unit. Um, and practiced for about five years, also did a little bit of part-time work in the skilled nursing facility setting um, because I developed, and even since high school and throughout college and grad school, um, and certainly throughout clinical practice, developed a, a strong passion for working with the older adult population and wanted to um, do all I could to help older adults age in the homes and communities of their choosing, or um, as we know, age in place. But uh, after about five and a half years of clinical practice, I realized that I wanted to expand uh, my work with the older adult population um, and particularly expand that work beyond just the medical model or beyond the what we might consider to be the, the traditional uh, healthcare system. And so I decided to pursue, pursue a PhD in social work and enrolled in Ohio State's um, College of Social Work PhD program and specialized in gerontology, again, to focus um, my, my research work on that older adult population, but also specialized in the field of implementation science. And uh, after graduating, I'm very lucky and proud to say that I am still at Ohio State now as an assistant professor in the division of OT, where I get to do the work, um, some of which I'll be able to, to share with you today, some of the projects um, that I've been a part of and, and helped co-lead and lead um, that all center on one main overarching question. And that question is, how can we help older adults age in the homes and communities of their choosing? Um, and in particular, how can we leverage the OT profession to ensure that older adults can in fact age in place? Uh, and as, as perhaps some of you in the audience know, um, 
with our older adult population, it's a growing population right now. We have an estimated about just over 50 million older adults in the US and that number is expected to double to roughly 100 million uh, by the year 2060. Uh, but not all of those older adults are going to need OT services or will be appropriate for OT services. And so when we think about aging in place, um, we really have to, to refine this question a little further and ask, well, who is at highest risk for hospitalization or still nursing facility placement? So who is at highest risk for not necessarily being able to age in place? And who could be really um, those who benefit from uh, the, the skills and services that occupational therapy can provide? Uh, and so one answer to that first the, that question there, who's at highest risk, um, one group that um, I've worked with quite closely are older adults who receive social services. Um, and when I say social services, I'm referring to some examples that include home delivered meals, uh, congregate dining services. So this picture here on the right is just a handful of OSU students with um, a congregate dining client in Columbus. Um, social services also include transportation support and tra or assistance, homemaking assistance, so assistance with uh, grocery shopping, chores around the home, financial counseling, and respite care as examples. When we look a little further into the characteristics of social service recipients, um, we see that just about two thirds uh, have six or more chronic health conditions. Uh, just over half have three or more ADL impairments. So again, groups that are um, appropriate for occupational therapy services. 41% uh, have reported a previous fall in the past 12 months. Um, and that's uh, a higher proportion than the estimated 25% of, of the general older adult population who reported falling in that year time span. And 29% take over six daily medications. And we know that polypharmacy is also a fall risk factor. Um, so with all of these characteristics in mind, um, we know that first off, social service recipients are at high risk for health decline, just based on those risk factors in the previous slide. We know that occupational therapy services delivered in the home in particular can reduce that risk of health decline and can reduce the risk of institutionalization and that work I'd say um, has been conducted already by several folks that perhaps are in Kansas City right now. So thank you to those of you who have dedicated part of your career to um, addressing the needs of, of older adults, particularly those home-based needs of the older adult community. Uh, and lastly, we know that social service agencies reach older adults in their own homes and communities. And social service agencies might frequently employ community health workers, social workers, in some cases, nurses and dietitians. But um, less often do we see OTs embedded directly within those social service agencies. Perhaps agencies will contract with other home health groups to provide skilled OT care on a contract basis. But uh, that the, less often do we see actual OTs embedded within those agencies themselves as, as regular employees. So uh, I suppose where I'm going with this is that I'd like to make the argument that there is a prime opportunity to embed OT practitioners um, within social service agencies themselves. Uh, and so I can make that, that argument and that's, that's fine and well, but um, we really need data and evidence to, to back that argument and back that claim up. And so what I'll share with you over the course of the next uh, 10, 15 minutes here, just three projects um, that uh, have been designed to kind of help make this um, argument um, seem a little bit more valid. And so the first uh, project that I'll, I'll be sharing uh, relates to assessing gaps in the quality of care, first off, provided in social service agencies, and then drill down a little deeper to confirm uh, how OT can help fill these gaps in quality. And then lastly, wrap up with a, a five-year project that we have that just launched last year to demonstrate the value of OT. Uh, with social service clients. Um, and given that the talk, the title of my talk had the, the words impactful partnerships in the title, um, both of these, or rather I should say all three of these projects have been conducted in close collaboration with Life Care Alliance, which is a social service agency uh, in Columbus, Ohio. It is the third largest uh, home delivered meal provider in the United States. And just um, an example of a, an amazing uh, partner, an amazing group of individuals who are really committed to improving the care um, and lives of, of older adults. So first off, assessing quality gaps. Um, so this, this first project um, was designed to evaluate the use of evidence-based practices um, broadly in social service agencies. And there are a, a lot, and this is work I should mention that was drawn from my uh, dissertation. And there are a lot of evidence-based practices out there. But when we think about the risk factors of social service clients, um, and some of the characteristics that I previously shared, uh, we can narrow down some of those evidence-based practices and really focus on, at least what we did for this project, focus on um, evidence-based fall prevention practices. So implementing 
fall risk screens and assessments within these social service agencies. And so uh, the, the purpose of this um, project was to really examine the extent to which fall risk screens and assessments were implemented by my local community partner. And to do this, we uh, used a sequential mixed methods design characterized first by the collection and analysis of uh, retrospective chart uh, review data. So these, the social service agency routinely has to complete evaluations with their clients. That's just standard care. So we reviewed those charts to examine um, fall risk screen and assessment procedures if they existed. And then after analyzing those procedures, um, I conducted interviews with social service providers at our partner agency to, to get a more robust picture as to the, the good, the bad, the ugly behind being able to implement fall based, uh, or excuse me, evidence-based fall prevention practices. So looking at the 230 uh, charts that were eligible for inclusion in our retrospective chart review, when we look at screens, so fall risk screens that were implemented by social service staff with clients, um, only about 38% of clients were screened for fall risk factors. Um, there was no indication of any fall risk assessments being completed. So those are kind of the more in-depth assessments. Um, and then of those clients who did present upon screening with a fall risk factor, only 7% were then referred on by social service staff to some community-based fall prevention program, service, practice, intervention, what have you. So there's certainly room for improvement here. Um, and so then when we sat down and conducted interviews with home delivered meal providers at this agency, homemaking service providers, wellness service providers, they all said, hey, we understand that our clients are at high risk for falling. We understand that they're at high risk for needing nursing home care or more advanced level care. And we know that fall prevention is important. But when it comes to us trying to implement fall prevention practices, whether those are fall risk screens, fall risk assessments, or fall prevention interventions, we're facing a lot of barriers. Those barriers would include a lack of time and resources to be able to implement screens, assessments, and interventions. We also don't necessarily know if somebody does screen as a positive fall risk, so they're at risk for falling. We don't know who to refer them to. That's not part of our routine practice. We lack knowledge about how to implement certain fall risk screens and when to implement them. If somebody does happen to be at risk of falling, we don't have uh, systems in place within our agency to communicate those fall risk concerns to somebody else who could then refer a client on to another type of level of care. And then lastly, if we were going to take the time to implement any type of evidence-based practice, fall related or not, um, we of course have concerns over reimbursement. Who's going to pay for our time? Who's gonna pay for any additional uh, resources or equipment that might be tied to those fall risk screens, assessments, or interventions? So this certainly paints a picture of some of the quality gaps that exist in the social service setting. And uh, certainly we're just, we're focused on falls right now, um, but the focus on falls can translate to other areas. Um, and I might be able to, to say just with this project's first project, like, hey, let OT come in and save the day and, and help fill these quality gaps that you have in social service agencies. But um, I, I've tried to do that. And that's, uh, I guess, kind of putting the cart before the horse. We need a little bit more data to really help demonstrate that OT can improve the health and safety of these, of these clients who are at risk for health decline. And so project two was about collecting additional data to really characterize the health and safety needs or the OT related needs of social service clients. And so to collect those data points, um, we first wanted to implement standardized tools to identify just that, the OT related needs of social service clients. And so the main tool that we implemented as part of this project, which just wrapped up last year, um, was the Inter-RII Home Care Frailty Scale, which is a 30-item questionnaire evaluating um, different domains of frailty, including all of which fall under OT's scope of practice, uh, and include domains such as mobility, function, cognition, uh, cognitive function, social interaction, nutritional status. Um, and so that was our main tool that we, that we implemented. We had staff administer this tool with clients. Um, uh, and we were also actually in interest of my local partner, in addition to implementing the home care frailty scale, um, my local partner agency also wanted to start collecting data representing the frequency with which clients would call um, their local emergency medical service uh, department, so call 911 um, due to something like a fall, due to a, in some cases, a, a non-medical emergency. And so we began tracking those client calls as well. And then also we were interested in, in a particular interest again to my uh, local 
agency partner wanted to collect data representing the common health conditions as experienced by clients so we could figure out if there were certain subgroups of clients based on medical conditions uh, who would benefit most from, from OT. Uh, and I do just want to bring this up really quickly. I know I'm not um, talking a lot about the, the procedures and methods we used to actually implement the, the standardized tool, in this case, the home care frailty scale, but I just want to show quickly, give a shout out to the field of implementation science that is near and dear to my heart. Based on project one, when we identified those barriers to EVP use, we drew from those barriers and mapped those barriers from that first project, um, mapped those barriers to implementation strategies that we deployed in an effort to try to implement the home care frailty scale. Um, so we're trying to take what we're learning from each project and build off of it so that um, we can, again, make a case that OT belongs in these, in these social service settings. Um, so I just wanna give a shout out to the field of implementation there. So when we look at the data points that we collected in this, in this second project here to confirm the need for, for OT services, um, when we look at uh, 562 clients over the, uh, between 2020 and 2021, um, we collected data points from that home care frailty scale, and we also um, were looking at the data that we collected related to the, the um, 911 calls made by social service clients. Um, if a client had a, reported a fall in the past 90 days, they were actually they were five times more likely to call 911. If they needed assistance with housework, they were two and a quarter times more likely to call EMS. And if they had difficulty walking, they were two times more likely to call. So again, these are all areas in which uh, OT could provide service. Um, to potentially improve these areas and therefore reduce the likelihood that older adults would feel the need to call emergency services. Of course, if there's an emergency, we want them to call, but what we were learning is that a lot of these calls could have been prevented, or in some cases were not necessarily medical emergencies. And given the nature of the type of services that um, Life Care Alliance, my local program provides, their largest program is their home delivered meal program or their Meals on Wheels program. So given the reciprocal collaborative nature and relationship that I do have with this local agency, um, I wanted to do analyses that were interested to them. And so we also conducted an exploratory analysis um, just of home delivered meal recipients and first looked at common health conditions of this, of this population. Uh, and 75% of the sample that we, that we examined and that we analyzed presented with the diagnosis of diabetes. And within that group, those with diabetes who received home delivered meals uh, were three times a greater risk for malnutrition and two times a greater risk for falling. And so I think these, these two statistics alone kind of paint a picture as to the complex needs of the social service population, in particular the home delivered meal population. Um, and certainly, can, o, can uh, the field of OT address fall risk? 100%. Uh, can the field of OT address risk of malnutrition? Perhaps, um, but I think that I would uh, be more apt to lean on the expertise of my dietitian colleagues to address concerns over malnutrition, particularly among a group of individuals um, who receive home delivered meals. And so we know that these are individuals who oftentimes experience food insecurity and have difficulty um, meeting their, their recommended dietary needs. So with those, Two points in mind, falls and malnutrition, again, paints a picture of the fact that these social service clients might need a multi-pronged approach to improve their ability or optimize their ability to remain living in their own homes and communities, which takes me then to our third project that is currently in the works, and that is, um, we're in our planning year, uh, that is this project that combines OT services and dietitian services for home delivered meal clients with the goal to improve overall health outcomes. So the way in which we are doing this, we are again in year one, um, we are comparing three groups of individuals and looking at the health outcomes of these three of these three groups. So first group is just receiving home delivered meals. Second group is receiving meals plus dietitian services. And the third group is receiving meals plus dietitian services plus occupational therapy services. And the way that this is shaking out so far, we do hope to enroll our first client by, by August 1st of, uh, of this year is that we're not recruiting clients directly from the community. Uh, clients are screened for study eligibility when they choose to call into Life Care Alliance's home delivered meal program and get meals started. So if the client is eligible and interested in participating, they're consented and we collect baseline data on them that represent their nutritional status, quality of life, falls uh, efficacy and frailty, and then follow up with them again at three months and six months. And clients are randomized into again one of these three arms just meals, meals plus dietitians, or meals plus dietitians and OT services. 
And so the long-term goals of, of this project, as well as the, the trajectory that I've tried to um, paint for you so far, is to, again, is to demonstrate the value of OT in social service settings. We might know it, we might see what that value is, but we need the data and evidence behind it to support that claim. Um, if our uh, project, if Project Free ends up um, leading to improved health outcomes, particularly for those individuals, those clients who receive dietitian and OT services, we'd like to package that protocol, that dietitian OT protocol for replication in other social service agencies nationwide, perhaps to a multi-site trial to examine, um, again, uh, effectiveness at, at multiple different, uh, geographically different, operationally different social service agencies. And then if we can do that and demonstrate effectiveness there on a wide scale level, advocate for OT service reimbursement um, through Title III funding, which is the main source of federal funding that comes to social service agencies through the Older Americans Act. Um, but all three of these long-term goals, again, all tie back to one of the first points on one of my first slides, which was um, the big goal here, which is a goal that's been a goal of mine, a career goal of mine for the past 15 years, is to keep older adults in their own homes and communities where the majority of older adults prefer to reside. Some key references, some acknowledgements. We're great, grateful, very grateful to have the funding and opportunity to do this work. Um, and of course, I'm extremely grateful to all the individuals that still on this slide, as well as others who I, I couldn't list, but I wish I could, um, who have provided support, encouragement, uh, intellectual contributions, and just general inspiration for um, the work that I am lucky to be able to do. Uh, these are the impactful partnerships that really matter and really drive um, this research agenda forward. So thank you all. Um, thank you for being here. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, uh, but do reach out with questions. My email is, is listed below um, and also have a, a great rest of your time at conference and in Kansas City. Take care. That was great. That's our 2023 Early Career Award. And for the future scientists, all the students who are participating in the back of our future scientists track this morning, some of you um, talked about an interest in aging in place and staying in their home. Lisa would be a fantastic mentor and person to reach out to, so I encourage you to do that. Okay, so let's move on. Our 2023 Mid-Career Research Excellence Awardee is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Beth Piatek. Um, is she is the director of the Lifestyle Redesign Knowledge Mobilization Initiative and an associate professor in the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Uh, please join me in congratulating uh, Beth on the 2023 AOTF Mid-Career Research Excellence Award. And if you could come on up and, and it's great to have you in person. Beautiful. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really an honor and pleasure to be here today. Thank you to the association, to the foundation, pardon me, um, for this award. So my talk will be sort of a past, present, and future um, of my research career to date, where things are today, and where I see them going. Um, and this was, I have to say, this award really prompted a lot of self-reflection. We were on a call. Um, earlier this year with some of the AOTF staff and as Scott Campbell reminded us, we are the representation of research excellence in OT. So, you know, it's a lot of pressure to feel like the living and breathing embodiment of research excellence in our profession. Um, and it really prompted a lot of thought of what, what is research excellence? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to our profession? So, um, I'm going to start by reviewing my research excellence to date. So this is the body of work that people judged me on when they decided I was worthy of this award. Um, second, I'll be talking about what do I think research excellence in 2023 should look like. So what are the societal issues, wicked problems that OT researchers should be expending our energy and resources to address? Um, and this is, can you see my thing? Great. So lastly, like where am I going in the future? How am I gonna take these lessons and um, incorporate them in the work I'm doing going forward? 
And um, throughout the presentation, I've incorporated a few quotes that really spoke to me as I was thinking through this talk. And so this is one that really resonated to the points that I just made. So we judge ourselves by what we feel capable of doing while others judge us by what we have already done. So let me share with you some of the work I have already done that I was evaluated on for this award. Um, and the criteria noted, you know, that the um, research excellence could be indicated by grants, presentations, publications, and impact on OT and society. So I thought publications seemed like a reasonable place to start evaluating impact. And I thought I'd look at my most cited work because this is, um, you know, should be the most impactful. It's been the most widely read and used by other people. Um, I put a couple parameters on this. So I thought. It would best represent my work if I included just first authored or senior authored papers. There weren't any senior in the top 10, so that eliminated two first authored articles. Um, and I thought it would be a broader representation of my work if I just chose one study, uh, sorry, one paper from each study, so I decided to have kind of a broader, um, sorry, I'm so nervous that the animations are like going right, okay. <laughs> sorry, because <laughs> I see it like one step ahead that you see it, so it's a little disorienting. Okay, so I will start with the first, um, actually the second most cited article I've written. Um, and naturally, many of these are from earlier in my career since they've been out for a while and people have had a chance to read and use them, cite them in their own work. Um, so this was an early study that I worked on as a postdoc and junior faculty. And I'm really um, pleased to see that this has been taken up so broadly. So there was a study that was looking at a transition program helping young people uh, move from pediatric into adult care who have type 1 diabetes. And this is known as kind of a, a big gap um, in a kind of area where people are at high risk for bad stuff happening, broadly speaking. Um, so they had a group of people at a children's hospital that they were helping to make this transition. And at the same time, they recruited a group of people who had already left pediatric care but hadn't found adult care providers. And they were just gonna bring them into the clinic and see how they did over time, which we studied. But I also thought this was a really great opportunity to do some qualitative research and understand what it was that was going on in their lives that had contributed to their difficulty in maintaining this um, continuity of care. Um, so through these interv interviews, I extracted a lot of what I called in this paper psychosocial stressors, I think adverse childhood experiences would be really um, analogous or similar to what they had faced, but, but just a lot of um, challenging life circumstances. And um, we also went on to analyze the relationship between those challenges and some of the clinical outcomes. So we found that people who had, and just to go, oh, no, I can't do that. So there was an average of 2.5 of these stressors per person. So a pretty high burden of, um, of adverse experiences. So the more of these experiences people had accumulated, um, the higher their blood glucose was likely to be, um, the longer they had been out of medical care, the more emergency room visits they had, and the lower life satisfaction, which is obvious. Um, but it wasn't really documented in the literature, so I was really happy to have this information out there that we could take into consideration when we thought about how to support people in um, maintaining access to care. So the second paper, this was um, part of my dissertation research where I, again, did qualitative research to understand the experiences and challenges faced by young adults with diabetes. Um, and one of the kind of primary findings was just the tension and need to reconcile the tasks and demands that are required of people living with diabetes with the uh, normative activities and occupations of young adulthood. And at any age, this is a challenge, but I think particularly because of some of the normative stuff. What is happening? Is this? Oh, okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to feel better if I can see what's going on over there. Okay. So, so this is particularly um, challenging, which I think partly accounts for um, the high rates of diabetes complications, of mental health challenges, um, and other kind of um, negative outcomes that we see with people um, with diabetes in this age group. So third up, this was the um, randomized controlled trial I did using um, KO1 funding, and I tested an OT intervention that had drawn on all of the qualitative research that I've just talked about in other papers 
um, as well as the Lifestyle Redesign Intervention Framework to develop an approach to support young people through these um, challenges that they encounter in their diabetes and their life. So um, in this paper, we found that we did improve both uh, blood glucose levels and quality of life among young people with diabetes. These are also all um, people from low socioeconomic background, and it was a very uh, racially and ethnically diverse group of people. So uh, it was very encouraging to see that OT could have an impact on um, this group. So we are at number four, I think. Okay. So this was a paper that I wrote from a study I worked on as a postdoc, and this was the pressure ulcer prevention study. The PI was Florence Clark, who was my mentor um, as an undergrad, uh, as a grad student. I think there's, okay. I think I know what's happening, and I'm going to roll with it. <laughs> so um, this was the first exposure, I think, where I started to think a lot about social determinants and what is the impact that OT can have in the face of people who are living with extreme uh, marginalization due to their income, due to their insurance status, their immigration status, their race and ethnicity. Um, and so this paper sort of documented that these challenges were cumulative and added to, um, to the burdens facing the study participants we were working with, where we were delivering a lifestyle intervention to help them prevent pressure ulcers. So these were people with spinal cord injury who were predominantly um, minority. They were all publicly insured. They um, often had a, an etiology of their injury that was due to violence. Um, so they had a lot of, of challenging life circumstances in addition to their injury. Um, and at the time, I thought, well, we need guidance for researchers who want to conduct RCTs to establish the efficacy of interventions that will help people um, with these circumstances. And my, my thinking has sort of evolved on that since then, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in this paper, I outlined kind of if you are a researcher looking to do an RCT, if the population you are working with is, is highly disadvantaged, here are some recommendations to um, conduct that research. Um, and rounding out the top five, which was actually the top ten since those studies we cut out, was um, I was surprised that this made it, and I was pleased. This is a paper I wrote in grad school um, when I was taking a course with Galia Frank on post-colonialism. And we were looking at um, rap music as a resistive occupation. Um, and looking back with the 2023 lens, I don't know who I thought I was um, writing about constructions of black American identity and culture because I'm a white woman. But nonetheless, I think that there was an important message in the paper about how rap music and hip hop culture can be used as a voice and a venue to express the needs and concerns of a community that has some limited um, opportunities to uh, express their views in other venues. Um, and the occupation of producing and consuming rock music could be seen as an important resistive occupation. Okay, so that concludes the um, work to date. And in thinking about its impact, there's some things I'm proud of and some things I wanna work to um, change in my research going forward. So I'm proud of the fact that I have focused my research primarily on addressing the needs and priorities of marginalized communities. Um, I am pleased that my research has reached a diverse um, range of audiences. So I've published in OS, OT journals, in diabetes journals, rehabilitation journals. Um, I'm less pleased with myself that I think the power that has been um, used in these studies has been primarily concentrated. Uh, among myself and other academics, and so there hasn't been the same degree of power sharing and community engagement that I think is really important to have a meaningful impact um, with marginalized communities. Um, and I'm less pleased that I think my impact has, similarly, because you know we're doing this in academia, that the impact has primarily been with other academics. And so I'd like to be doing work going forward that has a greater impact on society as a whole. So. Um, these were some of the thoughts as I reflected on my work today, and another quote that I felt resonated with where I was is that the end of all knowledge should be service to others. So now I'll shift to research excellence today and what do I think are the primary drivers of um, challenges in society that OT researchers can address or that I particularly want to address. Um, so another quote that resonated that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. So as you've noticed from the studies I've described so far, I have a particular interest in diabetes. Um, and I'll present a few studies of myself and others that have focused on um, 
disparities in type 1 diabetes outcomes. So this is my friend Shivani Agarwal study. She looked at um, across 300 young adults with type 1 diabetes in multiple centers to try and understand why there was a large gap in um, A1C between white and black young people with diabetes. Um, and so this is about a, almost a 2% difference. This is a, an incredibly significant. So 0.5% for those not in the diabetes world would be considered a meaningful change in A1C. So this is four times um, the size of a gap in A1C levels that would be considered meaningful for reducing the risk of complications. Um, and also both of these groups, all of these groups are well above the 7% um, goal for minimizing the risk of long-term complications. So we have a problem across the board, but we especially have a problem with um, treating people, treating black young adults and um, reducing their risk of complications. And what I think about when I see this study, it concerns me because my research has focused on self-management, my research has focused on psychosocial issues, and to a small degree, I think we have also an impact on treatment regimen because we do psychoeducation and we help uh, young people advocate for the treatment regimen that works best for them um, through our interventions. But if we add all of these together, we're still dwarfed by the impact of social determinants. And so my research isn't going to fix this problem, and that bothers me. So I think this is one of the things that made me think I need to change trajectory. Um, so that was a racial gap, so now I'll look at socioeconomic disparities. Um, so this was a study of 10,000 children with type 1 diabetes um, across the United States. And then the, what you see are socioeconomic quintiles. So we see the lowest SES on the left going up to the highest SES on the right. So this is about um, access to diabetes technology that helps to improve outcomes and quality of life. And you can see that there is a consistent gradient where there's lower access, the less um, the lower your socioeconomic status. Um, these slides also compare data that's current to data 10 years ago, and so we can see that um, pump use is about the same, but CGMs have increased in accessibility, but again, they've increased the most for people with the highest socioeconomic status. And they also looked at A1C, so now and again, um, I think for children, we're looking at 7.5% as a goal, and so you can see that every socioeconomic group is above that but the um, highest SES group is closest to meeting that goal as compared to the lowest SES. And you can also see from this that we're getting worse. So the light blue is where we were 10 years ago and the dark blue is where we, were, where we are today. So regardless of your socioeconomic status, you are at higher risk today for diabetes complications than you would have been 10 years ago. So something's wrong. Um, and lastly, this is a study that my group did where we um, there's a new metric of glycemic risk, and it's intended to incorporate um, low blood sugar, high blood sugar, all of the things that can be dangerous about having diabetes into one number. And so the higher your number is, um, the more you are at risk. Um, so it's a zero to 100 scale, and we wanted to look at which factors predicted what is your GRI score. And this was among um, 200 racially and ethnically diverse adults with type one. So we found, 6.2% of your score is explained by how much education you have. 7.8% is explained by what kind of health insurance you have. 8% is explained by what kind of diabetes technology you are using. 9.4% is explained by your race or ethnicity. Um, and maybe encouragingly, 17.3% is determined by your own self-management, how you approach your diabetes. But when you think about 17.3 versus the cumulative impact of all of the other um, social factors, it's really dwarfed by insurance, education, race, and um, access to technology. And I could go on, there's a lot of other studies that have looked at these issues, but I think that this communicates the point. And if you're not uh, into diabetes research, I think it's also important to note that this is true across the board. I could have chosen any diagnosis and I think I could have found very similar studies. So um, this is data from the county health rankings where they looked at the contributors to um, both quality of life and length of life and across the board about 20% is explained by um, access to health care and quality of health care. About 30% is explained by our health behaviors. Uh, and we often tell ourselves, well, we work on health behaviors, so I think we are contributing in a meaningful way. But we typically work on health behaviors within the context of the healthcare system. So to me, that goes to access and quality of care more so than it does to our impact on health behaviors. Um, sorry, this is, is, has a mind of its own. So 10%, the physical environment, 
and 40% socioeconomic factors. So if we want to actually make a difference for people, I think we're focusing in the wrong area, and I, myself included. Um, so another quote that resonated with my thinking, why are we treating people and sending them back to the conditions that made them sick? And I was trying to think of a metaphor here, and my partner, he says, well, it's like, you know, those of us, you know, who have these advantages in this training, we're all sitting in lifeboats, uh, and people around us are drowning, and so we pull them out of the water, and we give them a snack, and we say, okay, now keep swimming towards the, you know, towards safety, which is like all we can do, and it doesn't feel like much. So, looking toward the future, what am I going to take all this information and do with it? And um, as Albert Einstein adeptly said, we don't always know what to do with it. If we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research. Um, so I don't have answers per se, but I have a few thoughts to conclude my talk. Um, so this was a, a, there was a paper that really resonated me, with me, and it pointed me to um, a system map. This is of obesity, and the point is not to understand what all these factors are. The point is to illustrate the complexity of the chronic conditions that we are uh, encountering today that's contributing to the majority of disease burden and how many factors are contributing and how um, limited it is to think that we can solve these problems through RCTs, which are by design really isolating individual factors. They're not taking into account the complexity of this whole system. Um, and this quote I really appreciated, that if policymakers or researchers want to know how a complex social world works, RCTs are about as much practical use in providing that as is a chocolate teapot for holding tea. I see that, I say that as someone who has millions of dollars from the NIH to do an um, RCT right now for diabetes. So, so I'm obviously, you know, speaking to myself here in wanting to rethink how do we approach research and impact. Um, and lastly, this is a paper, it was fresh off the press literally, I think two weeks ago, and it resonated with me. There, um, the author is um, adopting the metaphor from Audre Lorde who spoke really powerfully about um, racism and marginalization and how we cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. And he makes an argument that the traditional um, hierarchies of evidence that we think of, and the traditional standards for um, you know, what constitutes evidence that's strong enough to act on, is are the master's tools in the sense that you know we, we could do these studies over and over and because of the complexity of the situations, we're never going to hit on the answer through what we consider you know, the gold standard of evidence, RCTs. And so we need to broaden our perspectives um, and that you know, the author highlights there's going to be resistance within the academy, within research um, institutes, formidable challenges, but nonetheless, um, we need to change our discourses and our priorities in order to make meaningful progress toward health inequalities. And so I'm still learning, I'm working on this, I'm trying to educate myself into what methods are going to be more impactful and um, I wanted to just share my own experience and example and hope that others are also um, interested in taking this on as well. So thank you for your time. I forgot to acknowledge all the wonderful people that I work with. I'm sorry, but they're great. Thank you, Dr. Pytek. Um, it's obvious why you um, are our 2023 awardee, so congratulations again. Okay, we're going to go uh, move on to the Academy of Research. Um, so established in 1983, the AOTF Academy of Research in Occupational Therapy recognizes individuals who have made exemplary, distinguished, and sustained contributions towards the science of occupational therapy. And it is with great honor that I'm able to present the 2023 AOTF AOR inductees, Dr. Carolyn Unsworth and Dr. Suklik Liu. Dr. Unsworth is professor and discipline lead of the Occupational Therapy Institute of Health and Wellbeing at Federation University, Australia. She is an internationally respected researcher and educator in occupational therapy with key research interests in public transport access and driver assessment and rehabilitation for people with disabilities. She is also known for her contributions to the fields of health outcome measurement and clinical reasoning. Dr. Unsworth's research has informed transport improvements and policy changes for people with disabilities nationally and internationally. 
her outcome measure, OSTEMS OT, and driver assessment OT, DORA, are used internationally. In 2017, Dr. Unsworth was inducted in an inaugural fellow of the Occupational Therapy of Australia Research Academy. Please join me in congratulating uh, Dr. Carolyn Unsworth, who will present her journey in occupational therapy and her research in occupational therapy. Close the last presentation, find the next one. Ready? We're in slideshow? Yeah? Great. It's an honour and a privilege to be presenting to you today, so thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about three areas of research that I'm passionate about, as you've heard, which are clinical reasoning, assessment and outcome measures, and transport mobility. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that, with my clinical reasoning hat on, that we're using Dreyfus and Dreyfus's uh, expertise trajectory. We're all on a research learning curve. And I'd like to pay my respects to the enormous wealth of knowledge here in this room about research that we're all sharing. So to start with, I've put up a bit of a metric slide. I'm not sure how big this is, but you don't need to read it. What I just wanted to say was that there's a lot of metrics behind um, the work that I've been doing. So I'm going to use these symbols throughout the presentation to highlight the areas that I'm talking about, clinical reasoning, outcome measurement, and community transport mobility. And you can see the metrics that sort of stack up. And at the bottom, I've put the summaries. But I think what's really important is that 140 journal articles and the H impact that comes along with it don't really speak to the impact that the research is having. And Beth's talked about that as well. So what I'm going to really focus on is what is some of the research that I've been doing over the past 30 years, what's it meant to people and how are people using it? And to be honest, I also spent a lot of time reflecting on what a challenge this was. It's not straightforward. So to start with, um, uh, clinical reasoning has been a really important part of my, my origins in research. This research is fundamental to the practice of occupational therapy every day. My research has led to a new model of occupational therapy clinical reasoning, and what's some of the impact of that? Well, initially, the work has led to introducing a new method of study, and there's one of the photographs of me in the early um, photographs of the work that we did using head-mounted video to explicate clinical reasoning. And this has really led to generating research evidence for practice. It continues to build the language of practice and also to explicate theory and demystify clinical reasoning. And the best evidence, I think, for this is that through the um, book chapters that I've written in this, in this area, OTs come up to me at conferences and say, ah, oh, you're Carolyn, you wrote that chapter on clinical reasoning. That really helped me when I was a, a, um, a student going out on fieldwork and it really enabled me to carry forward my journey in occupational therapy. That makes a lot of impact for me. The next area that I want to talk about is outcome measures. And I've been involved in, measure, in developing four outcome measures over my career. And I'm going to speak a little bit about the first two. So Ostom's OT and OT Dora. The second two, the um, POMADARS and POMADAT, the Powered Mobility Device Assessment and Training Tool, and the Powered Mobility Device autonomy residential screen are freely available and you can look at those another time. Um, but I wanted to talk about OSTOMS to begin with. So OSTOM stands for the Australian Therapy Outcome Measures. Um, and even though we developed it in Australia, it is for use internationally and it's widely used internationally. We developed this with half a million dollar grant from our Commonwealth Government back in 2001 to 2004. And we've since published over 20 articles on this to really disseminate this important information. 
The ostroms are used internationally. We've translated the OT scales into Swedish, Japanese, Arabic, to name a few. There are, I believe, Turkish and Chinese um, translations that are underway. Ostroms is used by all clients of any age with all health conditions in all health settings. And it's a great tool for OTs. OTs pick the goal that they're working on with their client, so the client generates what they want to work on, and the OT selects from 12 function focus scales, which are highlighted in purple. Now, these all align directly to the ICF, and then the way that we score clients is also um, directly aligned to the ICF. So we score clients on their level of impairment, activity limitation, their participation restriction and distress well-being, and we do that for both the, the carer as well as the client. And we can score clients um, from zero to five with half points, giving us a very sensitive 11-point ordinal scale. We've got fairly robust psychometrics when we're using OSTOMS. It's been validated with clinicians um, and academics. We have reliability ICC for all 12 scales between 0.7 and 0.9. It's very responsive to change over time. And my lovely um, bowl there of alphabet soup, which is we have um, a minimum change detectable and minimum clinically important difference of half a point. So we, we know a lot about this tool and how well it's working to show change. And I think what's been really impactful about developing this measure and using it over 20 years is really about um, the joy in seeing groups of grass level <clears throat> excuse me, therapists using this every day in their practice. And many therapy groups talking about for the first time being able to understand what their data is and then looking at what can they do with their data. So all over the world there are groups of clinicians who are using OSTOMS data to go through these five steps. Collecting some data, entering it into a statistical package, getting support to analyse that data, to look at it and interpret it, often for the first time, to take back to the funders and managers that they work with, to be able to say, this is the impact of our OT service. These are the changes that our clients are having. And then translating that back into improving the services that they're delivering. So the impact of this research has really been to champion outcome measures and I have colleagues in the room here who are doing the same. So the, um, through the OSTOMS, I've gone all over the world and delivered countless seminars and spoken to therapists to really facilitate and encourage people to collect outcome measures to support our profession. This is, um, therefore, using OSTOMS and other measures that I've been involved with has really generated um, a lot of support for the profession. We've been able to communicate what we do to others and really this has led to supporting, directly supporting OT practice. And then the next area that I want to talk about combines my passion of both outcome measure with community transport. And this is through development of the Occupational Therapy Driver Off-Road Assessment Battery or OT DORA as it's affectionately known. When we first started, the acronym we came up with was OT DRAB, and of course it just wasn't going to fly. OT DORA was much more fun. We did have to check out at the time. I don't know if any of you remember Dora the Explorer, but she was a wonderful children's cartoon. We had to make sure that this was going to be okay, and it was. So we published OT DORA with the uh, American OT Association Press in 2011. It's a clinically based assessment, so we do use it before we go on road with our clients. And it's fully comprehensive. It considers the client's background and then looks at their cognitive, physical, uh, sensory status. It's standardised. We have lots of research evidence that we can use to, to really um, ensure that this, is, this tool is working the best it can for OTs who are working with clients to determine fitness to drive. There are six different areas um, in the battery and many of these areas contain well-established assessments. But what I want to talk about for a few moments is one of the assessments that we develop, which is the OT drive home maze test, which is within the cognitive section. So the OT drive home maze test is really um, a tool that we use to look at um, clients' capacity 
for um, being able to plan, problem solve, and make decisions quite rapidly. And we score it based on the number of seconds it takes a person to complete the maze. So it's, it's if I press this, is it gonna play? Did that play? And the sound is really soft. So I'll tell you that what she's saying is, oh, so I have to get the, um, the car up to here at the house. Oh, is that what I have to do? And she takes in all four minutes to do this task. So in fact, what we've learned from our research is that young people who are around 18 can complete this task in under 20 seconds and that for drivers who take more than 100 seconds, they're very likely to go on and fail their on-road assessment. And so this lady's no exception at four minutes. No need to tell you that she didn't pass her on-road assessment. But one of the interesting anecdotes from developing this particular test was that people, drivers who were taking this test, didn't think it was very relevant and complained about performing this particular test in the clinic. However, what I did at that point was I drew a car at the start of the maze and a house at the end and said, show me how you'd drive home, which is how the test got its name. And since that time, clients think this is a very important test that they need to be undertaking. So the next slide has far too much on it, but I wanted to tell you that there's a whole bunch of measures and data that supports the drive home maze test. But three things I want to tell you is that it's valid for populations. We know that normal clients who have a mean age of 63 years take 25 seconds on average to perform this task. We know that following stroke, and this will be very interesting for our next presenter as well, if we take a, a similar sample with a mean age of 63 years, that those who pass have a mean time for the maze test of 42 seconds, so slower than typically clients, but but still slower, um, but still able to pass the test. And those who fail take 90 seconds. So then we started to look at uh, validating the tool for hand dominance and making sure that right-handed test takers and left-handed test takers had an equal opportunity to complete a test that you're completing the maze across your own wrist. And then we looked also, and we found that that was true, that there was no difference for right and left-handed test takers. And we also then looked at what would this test be like for clients who are using it with their non-dominant hands, so following acquired brain injury or for people who'd had an amputation? Could they perform the test? Would we need to make an adjustment for them? And we found we did. We found that for drivers who are under 61 years of age, we needed to multiply their score by 0.833, and for drivers over 61, we needed to multiply by 0.929. So we've done lots of work on this test, and it's also very predictive of on-road performance. So a CART analysis, which is a classification and regression tree analysis, which included the OT drive home maze test, will correctly predict 88% of clients who are fit to drive and 72% who are not. So what's the impact of this work? Well, again, it's an evidence-based measure which is widely used in practice to support practice. And it aligns directly with our Australian competency-based standards for practice as driver assessors, which I also developed with one of my PhD students. So this assessment supports valid and reliable decisions being made for our drivers. And the work that I've done has been directly informing guidelines. For example, our National Medical Fitness to Drive guidelines and various practice guidelines. For example, the Stroke Association's Fitness to Drive guidelines. I also regularly get invited to present at government hearings in areas such as older drivers and road safety. The final area that I want to talk to you about is also in my passion area of community transport mobility. And it's the work that I've currently been doing over the past around seven or eight years. So in this particular work, we're really looking at improving bus safety for bus passengers who use mobility devices and looking at the effectiveness of containment systems. So I started out seven years ago working with our transport authority, which is our governmental agency running the transport system, looking at access. So some of those photographs on the right show the work that we did in undertaking 3D scans of the interior of buses, 3D scans of people using mobility devices and meshing these to determine best fit. 
And from there, the government discovered that actually our research group was going to be quite helpful for them to solve a lot of other problems that they were having, which were with the number of incidents of tip and slide with people in their mobility devices. So they continued to fund our work to look at the safety of both people using mobility devices and ambulant passengers. They really challenged us to work with them to make sure that we were ensuring user independence, but that we were also looking after the bus drivers and considering their occupational health and safety, given the difficulties with getting down on the floor to tie people in their wheelchairs. They challenged us to consider dwell times, which are the all important metric for bus operators, as some of you probably know. And this project was a really successful collaboration with industry. So throughout this process, I've been working with the governmental agency, bus operators, the bus drivers, the bus companies, and the bus builders. So this has been um, an important adventure. So we, as you know only too well, in order to develop something that we um, wanted to use, we first looked at what already exists. And in the US, you use automated, or wheelchair tie-down and restraint systems, WTORs. In contrast, across Europe and most, of, uh, most parts of Asia, they use passive containment system, which include rearward facing barriers and some kind of aisle staunchions to contain people in the space. The government, our government, was very interested to look at which is most effective, what should we be using, given that we weren't doing very much at all. This is very surprising in a country such as Australia, where we were the first to legislate for seatbelts in vehicles in the 1970s. So we started out with our team of occupational therapists and engineers looking at understanding if we were going to contain people in buses, what were the movements on buses that were causing problems? And actually, there's no published data on the G-forces that are pulled as various bus manoeuvres are undertaken. So this was the first study that we did. We put bean air accelerometers into buses and we collected bunches of data. Now this is a really interesting graph to me because it's, and it's the most easy to interpret. It's the x-axis for movement, which those of you who work with engineers will understand well, is the forward movement. So what this shows is a bus on its journey. And as the bus accelerates, it accelerates rapidly and it peaks at around 0.3 Gs, which is fairly harsh acceleration shown in the green circle. Then the bus continues on its journey and you can see it stops for a while, which is circled in yellow, before again, a harsh acceleration taking off at 0.3 Gs, followed by rapid deceleration and a moderate braking at 0.2 Gs. So this was really important to um, then be able to see, well, if we understand what are the movements that are being um, experienced by people in the mobility devices, what can we model that so that then we can look at how we might contain it. So this next slide shows, if I click on it, yes, it shows our modelling of a per person in a manual wheelchair and at what point exactly, what g-forces are being pulled, at what point will they begin to slide and then tip? And this is using um, the example of a horizontal right curve, so a typical right-hand turn that a bus will make. It's fairly graphic. Engineers love that, right? And then um, for the results for this, we then, if I just give you one example for a manual wheelchair, and again, this is just for the x-axis. In the first column, if we look at the driving conditions of normal acceleration and braking, harsh acceleration braking, and vertical curves, which are when you're ramping as the bus goes around a corner, and horizontal curves as you go flat around a, a less ramped corner. So we looked at those driving conditions and we looked at what were the real world forces that are generated in buses, which we collected through our bean air accelerometer studies. And then we looked at what are the point of tip. And what we found was that the points of tip would all occur within normal driving. So the next point for us was then to look at all of the different containment systems and how effective they were in our computer modeling to contain slide and tip. So there's three examples of unrestrained, in the middle, the system that you widely use here in North America, which is a tie-down system. 
and then looking at a new system that we developed and ended up patenting for free for use for the government, which is um, a lateral barrier as well as uh, a forward excursion barrier, which is that ironing board that's typically seen to stop people from um, uh, being able to tip or slide during harsh acceleration. So we brought in our experts, of course, throughout this research. This is my team of experts who have lived experience and use mobility scooters, wheelchairs, both powered and manual every day. And they provided enormous, enormously valuable feedback for us as we were going through the process to develop these different systems. That led to many changes as well, of course, because our experts tell us lots of things that we don't know and can't see ourselves. So what's been in the impact of this research? Well, the research that, that I've been leading has really informed transport policy and is being fed into the, the reform that we're undergoing of our disability standards for accessible public transport. It's been great to translate engineering techniques such as 3D scanning, computerised meshing and use these in health. We have developed a patent for a containment system and that's been a great and interesting experience and as I said, we've made it freely available. I've also been invited to speak at government hearings on the um, issues surrounding safety for people in, um, who have a wide range of disabilities and who need to ensure safe transport on the public system. Public transport, of course, being one of the important determinants of health. I've been a witness um, in a number of uh, legal cases for the state and really the impact of this has been this fantastic collaboration between researchers, both engineering and health, uh, bus operators and bus builders. So, yeah. That really brings me to the end of talking about the areas of research that I've been involved in over the past 30 years. And then in concluding, I wanted to reflect for some of you in the audience who might be um, on your research journey and starting out about what are some of the things that I think are really important uh, to make sure that your research has impact as well. So I think the first thing to talk about is making sure that you have a vision, staying true to what you want to achieve in your research and always thinking about the communities that you're serving and that you're working and collaborating with. Finding mentors, I think lots of people have talked about that and the importance of having a mentor. Um, finding your tribe and working with people who speak the same language. It's the one thing I've learned in collaborating with bus builders and industry um, is that we speak very different languages and trying to find common ground is important. So find your tribe, speak your language and then learn other languages as well to engage with other tribes. Um, having industry partners has been incredibly challenging but I don't think I could have had the impact in the research that I've been undertaking without those collaborations. So working with industry and putting yourself out there to um, really engage with others is vital. Saying yes to everything, we're all time poor, but you don't even know what, what aspects of research are really going to take off. So just putting yourself out there and saying yes to being engaged in different projects is enormously helpful. And finally, having a thick skin. Being a researcher is tough and challenging, and there's a lot of failures, problems and setbacks. But at the end of the day, um, being a researcher and having impact on problems that matter is really important. So stay true to your vision and support the communities that, that need that support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Unsworth, and congratulations again. It was a great presentation. Okay, our second AOR inductee is Dr. Sukli Liu. Um, Dr. Liu is a tenured associate professor at the University of Southern California, TH Chan Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy, with joint appointments in the USC Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy, the USC Department of Neurology within the School of Medicine, and the USC Department of Biomedical and Engineering within the School of Engineering. You have a big job. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Liu is also director of the Neuroplasticity and the Neurorehabilitation Laboratory, a member of the Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute, and a founder and the co-director of the USC Sensory Motor Assessment and Rehabilitation Training and Virtual Reality Center. 
Dr. Liu's current research is on stroke neurorehabilitation using big data brain imaging, greater compu brain computer interfaces, non-invasive brain stimulation, and virtual reality to develop more effective personalized treatments for individuals with stroke. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Suk Lu Lee on the 2023 Academy of Research inductee who will now present. And she said that she hopes I get three salaries for all this work. <laughs> I'd like to confirm that I do not. <laughs> Okay. Great. It's an honor to be here and thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I'm excited to speak today about some work that we've been doing at a high level uh, towards moving uh, the clinical occupational therapy practice towards personalized stroke neurorehabilitation. So for those who are less familiar with stroke, uh, what happens is blood flow to the brain, like what you see depicted here, gets cut off or interrupted. And when that happens for more than a few minutes, brain tissue actually starts to die and that tissue never gets recovered. It can't regenerate. Um, thankfully, due to medical advances, deaths due to stroke have been decreasing now for many years. However, over two-thirds of people who have a stroke still have long-lasting sensory, motor, or cognitive impairments that affect their everyday lives. As a clinician working with people with stroke, I had a lot of questions, uh, questions that maybe many of you have with whatever population you work with. Um, and the biggest question is always just, am I doing the right thing for this person at this time? Am I doing the best thing that I can to promote recovery? Um, and those are questions that have really helped to inform the research that I do. So obviously one of the biggest questions that I have as a clinician is, is there any way to predict or identify which treatment would be best for my client at any given time? so that I can have confidence when I go into the, the room that I'm gonna do the best thing for them. On a more scientific level, I was also wondering when I would see patients, how could two people have such different um, amounts, as, even though they have such similar like neurological presentations, they have such different amounts of recovery. Um, and why is that? Is there, I know there's probably so many factors like what Beth discussed in terms of social determinants, um, in terms of social support, in terms of their own motivation, but is there also a neurobiological underpinning for this type of difference as well? Uh, and then another question that I often thought about was, what about people who have severe motor impairment? So these are people that when I went to treat them, there wasn't that much that I could do for them, um, and they also knew that, and I think we both felt a little bit hopeless. Uh, so these are three areas that I've really tried to focus my research on in the last 10 years. Today I'll just give you a high-level overview of what we're doing to try to address the first two using big data and neuroimaging data sets. And then on the third one, using brain-computer interfaces with virtual reality. So uh, how many people here are familiar with ChatGPT? Okay, if you haven't, you should look it up. <laughs> you may not be watching the news lately. Uh, but ChatGPT is essentially an artificial intelligence or AI bot um, where it's now been trained on bajillions of words <laughs> that is uh, mined from the internet. And it can respond to you the way a human would with a relative amount of intelligence. Some might say above average intelligence. Um, and so uh, ultimately, I think what we would love to be able to do is create something like ChatGPT uh, for stroke rehabilitation where we could say, what is the best treatment for my patient and give it a few factors that we think are gonna be useful, like a brain scan and some personal factors and have it tell us this is what would be best. At the current moment, this is the best state of the art for ChatGPT. So this morning I typed in, what is the best rehabilitation treatment for somebody who's had a stroke? If you haven't used ChatGPT, this is what it looks like. This is in real time. You just type in whatever question you have and it just spits out its answer. Uh, this answer, of course, is based on what it's mined from probably many of our uh, faculty websites <laughs> about how to treat a stroke and what happens. So you can get physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. Um, but I think ideally a long-term goal for the research that I'm doing is to be able to create an AI model where we can feed in important information that's clinically relevant and available and get best practice recommendations. 
So one of the best factors that we know, or biomarkers, or predictors of recovery, is brain imaging. Um, so here we have three different people who have all had stroke. Oops. This is a sensitive little thing. <laughs> um, I'm not even going to try to use the trackpad to show you, but uh, there's, as you can see, hopefully, they have each of these people has a lesion in their brain. Some of the lesions are more readily detectable than others. Uh, but what's been interesting to me throughout my research is that it's not necessarily the volume or the size of the lesion that matters, but it's many other factors in the brain. So even though these three people have very different size lesions, they all have the same amount of motor impairment. And that's because these, um, the, the lesions actually intersect with the cortical spinal tract, which uh, is a huge impact on motor control. So what we've been doing is trying to figure out what other factors in the brain are important for motor recovery, and can we use those as predictors in an AI-based model for predictive recovery. Um, however, to do that, what we really need are hundreds of thousands of brains, the same way that ChatGPT has now read every single word of Wikipedia. Um, however, as you may uh, glean, getting hundreds of thousands of stroke MRIs with behavioral outcomes and rehabilitation treatment uh, notes is very, very challenging, and it's something that one group can't do alone. So in my research, I've collaborated with Dr. Paul Thompson, who's at USC, and he's the uh, founder of the Enigma Center for Worldwide Medicine, Imaging, and Genomics. Uh, and basically what it is is a very efficient, collaborative way to get large data sets by encouraging researchers who are studying similar topics to pool their data together. So if each researcher only has 20 subjects for their own research study, but we get 100 researchers to pool all of their data together, we start to get thousands of data sets. I developed and, and chair the Enigma Stroke Recovery Working Group. At this point, we have over 100 researchers across 15 countries. We have um, thousands of high-resolution brain MRIs and behavioral data sets from over 50 different research cohorts. One of the things that we've been doing with this data, well, the first thing that we had to do with this data is figure out how to manage it and how to use it and how to scrub it. So we've spent a lot of time developing neuroinformatics pipelines and tools to be able to receive and harmonize uh, data collected across different research sites. Um, this part's a little bit boring and very technical, so I will skip over it. <laughs> but I just want you to know a lot of work goes into making it something that you can then apply cool, cool methods to. So once we have a clean, large data set, uh, we can start to apply AI and computational modeling to address many different problems. And I like to think of these in terms of several levels of problems. Uh, the first level is technical, so how can we use AI to help us do automated processing of these brains to extract the information we're interested in? Things like segmenting the lesions automatically or extracting regions of interest out of the stroke brains. The second is scientific, so can we actually start to then use the data that we have to identify complex brain behavior relationships and uh, essentially pick out biomarkers that may be predictive for stroke outcomes? And then the third level is clinical, so how can we predict stroke outcomes using whatever data that we have and whatever biomarkers we've found? Um, the spoiler alert is that we're only on the scientific level and we're working on the clinical level now. Um, so I'll talk briefly about technical and then scientific uh, for this talk. On the technical level, I just wanted to share one thing in this talk, which is that um, one of the things that we've done and that you know I've talked a lot about AI needing a lot of data uh, is actually data sharing. And that's something that we really support and encourage. We encourage open science and data sharing because it really helps to reduce research waste and move the field forward. Um, one example of this is a data set we have called Atlas where we shared over 1,200 high-resolution stroke brain MRIs along with manually segmented lesion masks for each subject. Um, and we made this publicly available so anyone in this room could download it now, if that's your thing. <laughs> um, and you can use it, what we really did it for is for the machine learning and computer science communities so that they could have a large data set to train new algorithms on. Uh, but what we found is that when you share data, it takes on a life of its own. Um, and so this data actually has not only been used for the intent that we uh, put it out there for, but it's also become a huge training tool and benchmark data set. So it's now one of the key data sets used in Stanford's computer vision class. Um, it's been used by tons of master's students um, and PhD students, especially during the pandemic when they couldn't acquire their own data. They were able to download this data and use it. Um, and so I just encourage you, if you have any data that you think could be useful to others, to think about sharing it in order to help move the field forward. On the scientific note, what we've really been studying is um, kind of what parts of the brain or what aspects of the brain are correlated with stroke outcomes so that we can use those as biomarkers in clinical models. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of attention has been given to looking at kind of where the lesion is, how big it is, and what's damaged. But what we wanted to focus on is how healthy is the tissue 
that's not damaged because that's essentially the brain tissue that we use to promote recovery. So in one study, we looked at 828 people with stroke using high-resolution MRI and outcome measures, and we found that non-lesion deep gray nuclei, such as in the thalamus, putamen, and nucleus accumbens, are uh, correlated with sensory motor outcomes, and that these relationships differ during time after stroke, so in the early stage of stroke versus chronic stroke, there are different relationships, and that these regions can only predict sensory motor impairment, uh, but they cannot predict sensory motor function, which is how essentially you can use whatever abilities you have left, uh, which we think are probably related to higher level brain regions. Uh, we also have shown that a hippocampal volume is also correlated with sensory motor outcomes after stroke. So this is exciting for us because uh, for those who are familiar with uh, brain regions, the hippocampus is the classic or quintessential region associated with Alzheimer's disease and uh, cognitive impairment and memory loss. Um, and so it hasn't really been studied in the context of sensory motor uh, outcomes, especially in stroke. Uh, but this study found uh, in 358 people that there is a link between the volume of the non-lesioned hippocampus and sensory motor outcomes, which to us provides a neurobiological substrate for cognitive motor interactions after stroke. Um, so that's something that we're looking at now. However, outside of just specific regions, we also wanted to see, is there a way that we can quantify the whole brain uh, in a way that would give us a useful metric? Um, so that's where we turn to a measure called brain age. Um, how many people have used at some point in their lives, the face age app or face age predictor. This was like all the rage on Facebook maybe like five years ago or so. You could essentially upload a picture of your face and then it will predict how old you are based on your facial features. Uh, realistically, it's things like, do you have wrinkles? Do you have hair, et cetera? Uh, this poor gentleman here is, oh, oops. This poor gentleman here uh, is being predicted as being 65 years old, whereas George Washington is only 56 based on their facial characteristics. Uh, anyways, the point is uh, we've now uh, in science that people have worked on creating something similar, but it's called brain age. So in this case, instead of feeding in a picture of your face, you can feed in a brain scan and it will tell you, based on features of the brain, how old it thinks you are. And importantly, across many different aspects and clinical disorders, uh, the brain predicted age difference has been very strongly correlated to functional outcomes. Um, so that's essentially meaning that if you are 60 years old, but your brain age is predicted to be 70, uh, that means essentially that your brain looks 10 years older than you actually are. Um, and that kind of aging brain situation is correlated with things like higher risk for Alzheimer's, worse outcomes from traumatic brain injury, worse outcomes from multiple sclerosis, and more. Um, on the other hand, if you're 60 years old, but your brain looks like it's only 50 years old, uh, then that speaks to some level of resilience that's happening in your brain. Um, and so this is an interesting concept that's just been emerging in the last five years or so, and we just started to apply it to stroke. Um, and so in 963 people with stroke, we found that younger brain age is actually associated with better stroke outcomes. So this is similar to some of the other findings. Essentially, the health of the overall brain is extremely important to um, how well you're able to do after a stroke. And we also find that younger brain age actually mediates uh, and protects from the impact of focal lesion damage. Going back to my earlier question about why can you know, two people have the same amount of brain damage, but one can have really great outcomes and the other has poor outcomes, uh, what we find with the same data set is that a measure that we call brain resilience can predict that. So what we did is we matched people who had similar amounts of lesion damage, which is shown on the x-axis here, um, and we then looked at their brain age or brain age difference. And people who had younger brain ages, despite having even a very, very large lesion, uh, across the board had better outcomes than people who had uh, older looking brains. And so we term this brain resilience, a resilience to the focal infarct. Um, whereas in the other case, if the brain ages quite a bit after the stroke, we consider that as brain vulnerability. Um, and this is important and interesting to us because uh, we think that brain age uh, from other fields has been started to be shown to be able to be uh, intervened on with lifestyle interventions, so interventions on diet, exercise, et cetera. Um, and this could provide a possible neurobiological basis for why OT lifestyle interventions can improve stroke outcomes. So hopefully for these first two questions, I've given you a little flavor of how we're trying to address it. Um, and our next steps are to use now clinically acquired data to extract brain age and other biomarkers that we've found in order to create these uh, predictive AI models so that hopefully Sometime in the future, when somebody has a stroke, we can feed in some, a few features and then get a best prediction of how we should treat them and have a little more confidence about what we can do with them. 
Moving on to the last question, uh, we wanted to also know, is there anything that we can do for people who have more severe paralysis after stroke to give them a sense of agency and hope for their own recovery? So for those who aren't familiar, if somebody has no movement at all after a stroke, what you can do as a therapist is pretty limited. It's mostly passive range of motion, caregiver education, providing adaptive equipment, um, and in my case, a lot of think really, really hard about trying to move your hand. <laughs> Just try, uh, which is great, and sometimes that really did lead to some uh, recovery, but it was pretty frustrating for both the participant and the therapist. So one of the areas of research that I moved into um, when I went from being a clinician to a researcher uh, was brain-computer interfaces. So for those who may not be familiar, they are basically a way to read out directly the brain activity for somebody and give them feedback of their brain activity so they learn to control the brain activity and in doing so they can then improve their motor function. So it's like a backdoor to therapy when somebody can't move. And importantly, brain and muscle targets can be personalized to each individual. When I started doing this, I used, oops, Okay, thanks. When I started doing brain computer interfaces, we used real time fMRI neurofeedback. So, this is where we put somebody in a scanner, an MRI scanner, which is millions of dollars. Uh, we tell them to lay there and think really hard about moving. And in doing so, they were able to control their brain activity in the motor cortex, um, which we fed back to them in the form of a very archaic thermometer, which you see going up here. Um, and within just a few minutes, people are able to learn strategies to be able to control their own brain activity. And with training over multiple days, they're able to actually show some motor improvement. However, the issue is that obviously this is not super accessible. You need a multi-million dollar scanner, specialized equipment, and if somebody has a severe stroke, it's really hard for them to get transportation to even come in to do this type of therapy. So then I moved to make it more accessible. We used uh, EEG, which is a more portable and affordable form of non-invasive brain recording, and paired it with virtual reality uh, instead of the thermometer to make it slightly more engaging. One of the reasons that we used VR uh, is actually because it's extremely immersive and it makes you feel like you are what a, in whatever environment you're in. I don't think the sound on the video works, um, so I will just act it out for you. Uh, in this case, this person is in a mall doing a VR demo and they're riding a roller coaster. So what you see here is what they see in the VR headset, which is that they're going up the crest of the roller coaster and then about to fall down. Yeah, so there's no sound. It is going up the roller coaster. And then right when it crests, the guy pushes him and then he screams, ah, ah. <laughs> And it actually goes on for quite some minutes before he finally uh, thinks to take the VR headset off and realizes, oh, he's just in a mall. He's safe, as safe as you can be in a mall. Um, but what I like about the video and about the illustration is that it demonstrates the fact that virtual reality is very immersive and you can actually, it induces physiological changes in your body um, to make you think that you are something or somewhere that you're not. And so a lot of studies have shown that uh, if you're given an avatar in VR, you actually start to embody the principles of that avatar. So if your avatar is standing at the edge of a skyscraper, your hands might get sweaty, you might get butterflies in your stomach. Um, if you're given a childlike avatar, you actually start to exhibit childlike behaviors. So essentially VR has a way of tricking the brain into thinking that you are something or someone that you're not. So of course we asked, can we give somebody with motor impairments after stroke the ability to control a healthy avatar in VR, and will this induce uh, neuroplasticity that leads to motor recovery, essentially tricking the brain into restoring some pathways? We created a, a tool called reInvent. It's a brain-computer interface that takes brain and muscle signals that indicate somebody's trying to move, and it gives them feedback of their virtual arm moving, even if their physical arm can't move. This is what an early prototype looked like. So this is an EEG headset with virtual reality, and we're also recording um, muscle activity. And even though this participant can't physically move his arm, when his brain signals in the motor cortex indicate that he's trying to move, we show him in VR his uh, virtual arm moving. And so with repeated training, uh, people are able to learn to control the arm quite well, and they also start to show uh, improvements in motor behavior. We even found that for people who have some trace muscle activity, even if it's not uh, like focus muscle activity, like he can't do wrist extension, but he can generate a lot of power movement in his wrist, um, we're able to use that muscle activity and reinforce that because there's already a connection from the brain to the muscles. 
So over the course of the past five years or so, we've shown that reInvent can improve both brain and muscle activity, and that supports the recovery of some level of motor control. Uh, although it's not a huge amount of motor control in some cases, it's enough to give them the dexterity so that they can participate in other types of studies, which often have like a minimum cutoff. Uh, during the pandemic, we then converted reInvent, which was a lab-based intervention, into a tele-rehabilitation intervention. So this is what we call tele-reInvent. We are not very creative. <laughs> uh, we, it's basically we boiled it down to a laptop with two EMG uh, muscle electrodes in 3D printed cases. So it's low cost. Uh, we send it home with the participant, and we do tele-rehab sessions with them uh, over the internet in the comfort of their own home. And that's what this looks like here. And so we have a therapist, Miranda, here, who's um, working with a participant who can't move. Um, but he's using his uh, muscle activity to drive the movement in a series of arcade-style games. Uh, we've, at this point, shown that six weeks of tele-reinvent use leads to improved motor function, as well as improved cortical muscular coherence, or the connection from the brain to the muscles. Uh, importantly, Miranda, who is also a PhD student in my lab and who will be starting a faculty position at Towson University in the fall, uh, has also started to look not only at the technical side of things, but also at the implementation side. So going back to what Lisa Juckett was saying about implementation science, uh, Miranda is now looking at the implementation around using a complex tele-rehab intervention at home. Uh, just as a little plug for her, if you are interested, she will be hiring for a PhD student next fall. Anyways, I'll end this section by just saying uh, that this is a quote from one of our users, and this is really why we created reInvent. He said, I'm more proud, happy, content, and satisfied because you know you're doing something about it. You're not just sitting around hopeless and waiting for some movement to come back. Um, so that, I think, was really powerful for us to hear. Uh, just as a, a follow-up plug, uh, we are not the only people at USC, or obviously in the world, using VR for different things. Um, and to that end, with some colleagues, we've created the USC Smart VR Center. This is a center that aims to bring together researchers with clinicians to create scientifically rigorous and clinically impactful VR applications for healthcare. So if you're interested, feel free to check this out. Um, and then a last plug is that a question I often get asked at these types of talks is how did you get into programming? Where did you learn it from? The long story is I learned it from a lot of Google and senior lab mates, but I know that's not accessible to everyone. Um, so I'm really proud to announce that we have uh, created an NIH-funded program called Reproducible Rehabilitation Research Education Program, or Repro Rehab for short. Our goal is to teach people with clinical backgrounds how to program if that would be useful for their research. Um, and we have openings, we'll be releasing applications soon for our 2023 fall cohort. Um, we just finished our first cohort. We had about 25 fellows, some from occupational therapy backgrounds, uh, who are using programming now in their research to improve the rigor and quality of their work. Uh, we also have a lot of free videos about how to program, how to get started with programming on YouTube. Um, and we also are very happy to help you with data sharing. So if you have a data set that you'd like to archive, it's a service that we can provide to you. Uh, so with that, I will conclude. I want to thank my many, many collaborators, both in Enigma, as well as for VR and BCI work, as well as my amazing lab and all of our funders. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Liu, and congratulations again. Some fascinating work. Um, I'd like to invite the rest of our speakers uh, to come on up so that we could have some uh, Q&A uh, time. And I would encourage everyone in the room to uh, feel free to ask our speakers. Um, Lisa's not live on this, right? Correct. OK. Um, please uh, come up to the microphones up front. There's two here. Um, and feel free to ask any questions of our speakers. And when you come up, if you could just say your name and where you're from, that would be fantastic. Hold up, wait a second, let's get the speakers on. There you go. Okay. Uh, no, here, Sapphica, I'll take that one. Awesome. Thank you. I forgot all my questions.
questions. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Name um, and, and where you're from first, please. <laughs> I'll do my introduction That's again. perfect. <laughs> <Okay>. Excellent. <laughs> um, my name is Brooks Heimer. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, my questions are for Dr. Liu, and I have a few of them. <laughs> the first one, um, so the Enigma data set, is that just structural MRI? Do you have any interest in um, moving to functional or task-based MRI or anything like that? Yes, great question. Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> it is. <Okay. laughs> um, yeah, we, we started with structural MRI because it's the easiest to harmonize um, and to extract similar principles across different data sets. But we also do have task-based fMRI. We also have diffusion MRI. We have resting state. We have ASL. We have all types of different neuroimaging um, modalities. And we often welcome new members who want to come in and analyze that data. So at the moment, oh, we, I presented a few of our published studies, but we have about six secondary analyses going on with the different modalities that other group members are leading. So. Oh, very cool. Um, OK, I have two, two more questions, and I promise I will hand the microphone off. Uh, the next question is, so the EEG BCI interface that you have, do you, because you're cleaning that signal online, right? Is there a significant latency, and is that something that you're working to reduce, or how does that affect their behavior? Yeah, so the EEG BCI, we used pretty robust signals, so it was just beta band, uh, yeah. And so it wasn't, it was not, uh, that complex, I guess, in terms, it's a pretty robust signal. Uh, now we're actually just using muscle signals. So we do an online calibration at the beginning, uh, and then just any uh, muscle signal that's greater than the like baseline 30% that we tried to record drives the movement of the hand. Uh, it is an adaptive threshold, though, so that as they get better, if they have three successful trials, then that um, threshold increases. And if they have three unsuccessful trials, then it decreases. So it's supposed to mimic a therapist in that way. <laughs> Cool. Okay, and my last question is um, kind of more big picture. So you've done a phenomenal job of, of having collaborations that are interdisciplinary and, and spanning many biomedical fields. Do you have any advice for early stage researchers who really want to build that collaborative and that, that mentorship team that is not just, you know, OT or PT, but really, you know, representative of a lot of different fields? Yes, that's a great question, Brooke. <laughs> um, so I guess I would say uh, just reach out to the people that you're interested in working with. So um, like I've had, you know, I think we all talked about the importance of mentorship and finding good mentors over the years. And um, so I think even just getting one mentor who's connected um, to get uh, other connections is a great way to start. Um, and then that mentor can also introduce you to other paper, other people who have uh, work that's relevant. Uh, I think conferences such as this one and also going to obviously other conferences uh, of OT are really important for meeting people and networking. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, I'm always happy to help too. <laughs> so I'm happy to make introductions wherever they're relevant uh, to other people. I think for the most part, people tend to be pretty collaborative and maybe you guys also have some words because I think I think almost all OT research tends to be quite collaborative. Uh, we all work with people outside of OT um, and have that transdisciplinarity. So um, yeah, I would just encourage you to try, send an email, and go for it. So. Thank you. OK, I'll stop hogging the microphone now. For no, it's a great question. I don't know if either one of you want to comment on early investigators and mentorship and how to seek, seek that out. Well, I guess one thing that comes to mind, it, one of the best pieces of advice I received is work with people that you like. So I think it's really important to Yeah, so, so in terms of fit, in terms of is this someone that I can communicate well with, is this, you know, those things are equally important as to the expertise that, you know, you have on paper. I'll talk really loudly. <laughs> um, finding a tribe is really important and being able to, to find other um, 
colleagues that you can work with who are junior and band together as well because it's sometimes intimidating to approach someone who's really well established. So having a little network is, is a really good strategy too. So try that. And knock multiple times because we get a lot of emails and so sometimes we don't catch everyone. So it doesn't mean we don't like you, it doesn't mean we don't want to work with you. Great advice, thanks for the questions. Other questions from anyone? Larry, I thought you were coming up for a question. <laughs> well, why do you think, I have a, um, a question, I have a couple questions. I'll start with one while other people think a little bit. Um, uh, I really appreciated the reflection around impact and how in academia we're judged about the number of grants, the amount of funding, our H index, and shifting that thinking to how is our research changing the lives or impacting the lives of everyday people. And I just want to, I would appreciate a little bit of a further elaboration on how we as occupational therapy investigators and clinicians and educators can help shift that thinking. I think a lot about this. I worry a lot about this because there's so much Im um, importance placed on what's your H index and at the end of the day, what does that really mean? It means that you've been quite successful in this, this particular tunnel and at the end of the day, what we need to do is really think about our clients and that might be a whole community or it might be an individual and how are we best working with and collaborating with that person to get their best outcomes in their everyday lives for the goals that they've set. So I think placing that, you know, foremost in our minds um, allows us to shift the impact from, you know, a, a, a two-dimensional H index to a three-dimensional piece of work that changes someone's life. So I, th I think that's, yeah. What else are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree, and I think it may be, it, it needs to be both and for a while as we hopefully can get trends to shift. So, you know, I think we may need to think really strategically about like what's gonna be sufficient at an academic level to ensure that we keep pace in that setting um, and maybe giving ourselves permission to not strive to the highest age index if we can be okay at a you know mid-rate age index and be devoting some of our time and energy to things that we think are more impactful in the big picture. Um, because I think, I mean, it can be sort of you're self-perpetuating, like, oh, now it's 12, now it's 15, like, oh, my colleague over here, it's 20, I should write, try and keep up. And that's just, like, when you die, are you going to be wanting to put your age index on your gravestone, or are you going to be wanting to, <laughs> I know Sean Earl wants to put it on his gravestone. <laughs> but most of us, I think, um, you know, are, find other things more rewarding at the end of the day. Yeah, I think this is one of the beauties of it, of the OT community, is that we care more about the impact and the people that we're serving than the necessary like uh, academic metrics. Although I will say that Paul Thompson's H index is second only to Freud's. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the power of the giant, giant collaborations. Um, but I, you know, I think one of the things that we started doing in our lab that Miranda actually has led is bringing in a stroke advisory board for our lab. So before we do any studies now, we tell them about the studies we're doing and they give us feedback mostly about if they think it's worthwhile or important or not, which has been very valuable and a little scary to be honest. Um, but it's actually led us to some new projects. So one of the things I didn't talk about is that we now have a NSF grant where we're actually trying to teach people who have physical disabilities how to program so that they can get programming jobs because programming jobs tend to be ones that you can do remotely um, so you don't have to navigate into a, a physical place or anything and they are more flexible. Um, but that kind of came from the fact that we would help people and be like, oh, you've achieved like seven more degrees of freedom in your wrist. Uh, in your wrist extension, and they would be like, what I would really like is a job. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, thinking big picture outside of just like the narrow confines of our academic training uh, to understand like what is it really that uh, the people that we're trying to serve want and how can we help them get there. And just to comment, um, the three of you talked about engaging people with the lived experience in, in all your work, and we are having a, our state of the science is about uh, community engagement, and so that's coming up soon. Um, anyone else have a question? Because I, come up, please come up to the microphone. 
You know, are you one of our um, future scientists? Yeah, so just so you know, we have our future scientists group of students um, back here, so please come up and ask your questions. So I'm Gabriela Torres from the University of Puerto Rico. And uh, this question is for Carolyn, Dr. Carolyn Unsworth. Um, most of our public transportation back in Puerto Rico is not accessible. And I imagine it happens <laughs> all over. But I wanted to ask you if you have any advice as to reaching out to government to carry out um, such adaptations. Because you mentioned that like, um, you worked with the government in Australia, right? Um, and it, was, it sounded like it was easy. So I w <laughs> but I imagine it was not. So I wanted to yeah, know about if you have any advice to work in that area. Well, I think um, that you've just paid me a great compliment. Because, right, I feel like a ballet dancer now. Because it's it's all you know how beautiful it looks, but actually it's really hard work and a lot of um, yeah a lot of injuries along the way. Um, so I guess uh, I it was baby steps for me to earn the trust of government to then you know get the repeated funding, and I think just starting out and doing something um, with them that you um, that you do for no funding. So just start out doing a project and say, look, we're really concerned about this and it might be ramp access or it might be there's no hard standing so that people can board or it might be about the, the space inside the bus, but I'd be really happy to talk to you about what that is. And then you start to talk with them about, well, what evidence is there for the day-to-day -day access for people and could we do this with you? And just do something small and then you show them that you're really committed to it how practical the work that you do is and how you can really make a difference. And doing that small project successfully and within a time frame that you've set shows them how reliable you are to do a, a piece of research that's impactful. And then you go to the next. So try and look at ideally where do we want to get to and what are the little projects that could show along the way to ramp up to that. That's what I found to be really successful in, and I'd be really happy to share those ideas with you some more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the question. Yep. Please introduce yourself too. Yeah, I'm Rob Motley from the University of New England. I'm part of the Future Scientists Institute. So my question is how do you ensure that the, um, the research and the results you're getting in these labs are actually trickling down into clinical practice? So I'm sure that it starts you know, publishing in journals, but Beyond that, um, like like the the virtual reality for stroke patients, like I I had never even heard of that in you know both my didactic and my uh, fieldwork settings where I was working with stroke patients. So how do you ensure that it goes beyond just you know being published in journals? Thanks. That's a great question. Obviously, I'm not doing that good at it. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, no offense. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I think there's definitely always room to improve. Um, you know, I will say for us, it's been mostly a research uh, project to see if it works. But now we're at the stage where we are trying to commercialize and trying to disseminate a little bit broader. Um, and so I think being able to talk about it at OT conferences, um, you know, we have a lot of ideas in the pipeline about doing continuing education around VR um, for, for different clinical needs and things like that. But I think just working more closely with my clinical colleagues who are day-to-day -day seeing patients is what's really helpful to know and hearing feedback from people like you that uh, maybe we need to try to do a better job with the dissemination is really useful. Yeah, yeah like I had heard of VR, like just broadly, like VR is used in stroke rehab, but I, I didn't know it was this, this cool. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a long pipeline for a lot of reasons, but some of the things that we can do to be more effective in, in moving things forward, um, if there are, uh, sorry, I'm not thinking of the right word, but thought leaders or policymakers or people in influential positions, making sure that they're aware of your research. So for example, in my field in diabetes, every year there's a call for like new research as they consider their clinical practice guidelines. I keep sending them OT stuff like one day. I know the words OT are going to appear there. But um, and similarly, like with payers and people who decide, you know, what's going to be reimbursed. Um, you know, I, in my area, which is kind of an emerging practice area, those are the kinds of things that I think ultimately will be impactful. Yeah, 
I, I would just imagine one of the challenges is like getting the other allied health professions on board, right? Because you don't want just OTs reading this, you want providers reading this, PTs. So has that been kind of challenging too, to get it outside of just the OT um, audience? Yeah, I mean, I would say, honestly, the biggest challenge is that when you wear an academic hat, it's so all-consuming sometimes that it's really hard to think about switching from, like, doing your, like, rigorous, like, peer-reviewed research to, like, switching to more of a marketing view and then switching to more of a clinical view and switching to, like, a government view. Like, you know, there's so many different roles that, in my mind, um, my, my dream would be just to have a team of people that each have these different expertises and be able to pass, pass things on across us. Um, but I think it's a really great question and an important one to think about. It reminds me that I've heard recently of researchers who've been putting their papers into chat GPT and saying like, can you write this at a, you know, third grade reading level or what have you? Because, you know, it does take an extra layer of time to write those pieces that are going to be more accessible to people outside academia. And so I think it would be great to leverage those tools to make things more um, accessible. I will also say that one time I made the mistake of including a marketing slide in a research talk and it did not land well. So <laughs> there really are different audiences and different ways of thinking about the content that you're talking about. Um, and I think being able to switch between those is some, a skill that we all have to learn yeah, so we can advocate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, uh, but I would ask everyone to please um, applaud our, our awardees. Um, before we get going, uh, I just wanted to let people know that we were just recently informed, actually the other day, that one of our profession's most influential people, Dr. Ann Henderson, passed away at the age of 98. And Dr. Henderson was an outstanding occupational therapy researcher and helped establish the phi, uh, pi uh, theta epsilon. And her family uh, asked us to let people know that those of you who wish to honor Ann's legacy um, they would request that you make a gift to AOTF just because of what Ann has done for our field and research. So um, our AOTF booth uh, has a QR code that you could use if you'd like to make that donation. Um, thank you for attending this year's Research Excellence Symposium. Um, for all of you out there, remember to nominate your colleagues um, next year. Uh, we hope to see you next door that way at the State of the Science Symposium, uh, which again is going to be focused on culture, uh, shifting the culture and occupational therapy uh, research and practice uh, with community engagement. So thank you very much, and again, congratulations. <laughs>